I'll now pass on to Carol to talk about a more interesting part of this talk, which is transfusion reaction um, documentation, monitoring, reporting. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge um, Slab for all the work that she's done. Um, without a transfusion nurse, we just wouldn't really get across the line um, for accreditation. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, that they're such a vital um, part of the hospital and uh, really, really important um, for blood uh, patient safety, but, but also to get across the line for accreditation, as, as I've said. Um, I'm from the medical tribe, and um, probably after anaesthetists and surgeons, we're probably the worst in the hospital for documentation, hence uh, Slav didn't entrust me to do the first half of the talk, I've just got uh, the second half of the talk. But my redeeming feature is that I'm O negative, which is the most perfect blood group. <laughs> Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the other members of my blood transfusion committee, which are, are really hard working. Some of them are in the audience. Um, I will have to say, though, that uh, Peter McCall, even though he's a very valuable member of our transfusion committee, has um, given us 20 extra patients a week uh, to see. And it is, it's is—it's not very much work we can handle it. But um, I'd also like to acknowledge with uh, Larry that uh, my husband is a surgeon. And now I understand why he'll never learn to pick up his dirty socks at night. Uh, but I will be taking up the matter of iron deficiency being a surgical issue tonight when I go home, because I'm hoping that I can organise that that 20 patient extra that we're seeing each week will be seen by the surgeons and that we'll be OK. But uh, let's move on to the real talk. Um, <laughs> um, the three things that I'm talking about relate to transfusion reactions, and um, it's about documentation. Uh, it's about uh, trying to reduce the risk of transfusion reactions, and that's really a nebulous topic, and it covers everything through that pr throughout the whole process. But I guess we're going to show today what we put in this section rather than saying that everything in the standards should be shoved into 7.6.2. And um, we'll also talk about how we do our reporting uh, internally and also, sorry, oh sorry, um, uh, apologies. Um, we'll also be um, talking about how we report internally and externally. Uh, many of you are already doing um, some of these things, so I might be uh, teaching you to suck eggs, but um, I'll at least um, try and, and talk about the things that we do, and it may have relevance for people who, who are only just starting working up this accreditation process. Um, with each of these standards, they have um, some reflective questions, and it's said that if you're able to answer these reflective questions, you should be able to pass accreditation. But um, some of the reflective questions I'm not that keen on. And uh, the first one is, how do we know clinicians ask about adverse reactions to blood and blood products? And I'll talk about that a bit later. And um, how do we record adverse reactions to, to blood or blood products? I'll be talking about the way we do it at our hospital, um, which um, we've, we've thought about a lot. And it may be that um, some of you are doing it better. Um, but um, uh, I think uh, it's important that we ch share these um, sort of things because in the end of the day, it's really about getting the information back to the clinicians and making sure that the patient's care is better. Um, Slav's already shown you this request form. Um, we do um, ask clinicians, uh, particularly if it's an extended cross-match, that they fill out uh, the transfusion history, um, whether it's been recent and whether uh, there has been a transfusion uh, reaction. Uh, this probably uh, is of little relevance, um, and uh, this might be controversial, um, but um, certainly within our hospital we'll have all those records. And, but we have found that if it person has had a transfusion elsewhere, uh, that the information that we get from this question and uh, whether they had a reaction is really very vague and unreliable and it really doesn't influence how we will process, process that pre-transfusion sample unless it's an ex extended expiry. And so I'm going to question whether that question about whether um, doctors are asking about transfusions, is that important? It sounds like it should be really important, but in practice it doesn't really influence very much what we do. We will um, 
release blood in our laboratory if the antibody screen is negative, whether they've had a transfusion reaction or not, because half the time that transfusion reaction may not have been related to the transfusion. It might have been a coincidental febrile reaction. And so that area, I think, is really a bit woolly, but this is my opinion and I'm happy um, to discuss it. I think, however, that might be one of the reflective questions that might need to be revised when the standards are being evaluated and morphed in the future, but that's my opinion. But how do we actually go about um, trying to reduce the risk of adverse events? Um, we've all been doing this for a very long time, but for the purposes of accreditation, I think many people are preparing a risk register um, as one of the, the prongs uh, of how we're going to, to answer this question. I've got three areas of how we're approaching this standard. And um, you can also see that um, when we're um, in our blood transfusion committee that we address uh, this risk regis register and we have an action plan about how we might address some of the risks. And I've got an example here and I don't want you to get too excited about whether um, you think the risks are allocated as being too high or too low, but this is just an example of a portion of our risk register that we prepared and we're really developing for accreditation further, um, looking at, at particular aspects of what, what the... Um, how do I make this work? Oh, well, in the left-hand column, um, um, we have state what the issue is, um, we, we state what the risk is, and then we have a look at whether it's an inherent risk and then by looking at our incident data we decide what the actual risk in the organisation is and then we document um, what the action plan is. This allows you to keep looking at this sort of um, information and deciding whether you've actually been keeping up with your action plan and whether you've been able to reduce your risks. It also filters up to the higher levels of governance for them to be aware of what the risks to the organisation are. Uh, I apologise for this busy slide, um, but this is just um, the, the second prong where we give some specific examples about how we're actually trying to reduce the risk of adverse events. And um, we all start with policies and uh, certainly um, we have a, whole, a policy that describes how you should uh, safely prescribe a blood transfusion and includes important things like how you decide on the rate, whether you give diuretics um, and, and things that have clinical importance to improve um, the, the safety of transfusions. Uh, we also um, have a, an education pro program as well as policies and guidelines about how you manage transfusion reactions and I think Slav's already um, described we, the fact that we do a clinical skills labs with the interns and we've been doing that for a number of years now so we think as the doctors get a bit older that they'll retain that information but uh, I know I'm a bit of a sadist but we quite uh, enjoy the bit where they suddenly realise and get sweaty that they are actually dealing with a mock transfusion uh, reaction and um, they really learn what checking the paperwork means uh, and finding that they're actually infusing an ABO incompatible transfusion as we pretend that we're um, sort of sinking deeper into uh, the reaction and, and um, uh, we do get some sort of macabre um, joy out of realising that they get it and that they will know what to do uh, should the situation arise, they'll quickly try and evaluate the paperwork, work out if it is an ABO transfusion reaction, and they know that they have to get some immediate assistance while they're getting the ABCs done. So we think that that's been a really valuable tool, and we know that hopefully many of the doctors in our hospital will know what to do if they are faced with a transfusion reaction. Um, we also um, involve the patient in um, this um, empowerment and being able to feel confident to tell nurses that they may be developing symptoms during their transfusion to assist with early um, diagnosis. And it's very important that um, we know about any pre-existing signs so we know whether things are changing or not. And I think also in addition to the interns we have many formal pro education programs. 
Um, we also, um, like many other hospitals, try to limit transfusions to the time when staffing is, is maximal on the wards um, to reduce the chances of um, incidents happening um, uh, unnoticed. Um, we're not the only institution who, who does that. And um, I will be talking a bit more about the trans transfusion reaction review. So why, why do we monitor it? people? Is it really just getting the charts lined up? Is it all about auditing? I really hate, as, as it has been mentioned twice today, this idea of auditing and not doing anything about it. The point of monitoring is that it does allow you to detect a transfusion reaction as soon as it's happening. And if you haven't been around to see the patient and check on them for an hour, things could get pretty nasty during that time. And certainly, uh, although I'm talking about my last point, uh, from the STIR data, the average time of, for an acute onset to be recognised was only an hour and nine minutes from the commencement of transfusion. And some of the data, both statewide and from us, does suggest that we might be good at doing the OBS beforehand, hopefully. Often the, the first 15 minutes is not too bad, but there's often a gap until the end of the transfusion, and that's where we might lose precious time in not only managing the transfusion reaction, but also stopping the antigen load that's being delivered to the patient by turning off the transfusion and limiting um, the degree of um, deterioration that the patient might experience. Now, certainly, um, Slav's been talking about our, our, our BAT tool. What we're hoping with this is that it really um, feeds back to the to the coal face what's really going on so that we can get that continuous improvement. Since um, we have had a transfusion nurse, we have been auditing and feeding back to nurse unit managers, talking at forums, and there has been slow improvement, but we're hoping with this back tool that there'll be much more ownership at the, the clinical level and that we'll really see quite a lot more um, practice improvement in a continual basis because of the frequency of it and the fact that it's being audited by the, the people on the ward rather than an external person coming in. And, and although it has its limitations because it's only a small snapshot of people, we think that instant feedback and, and, and ownership will make a big difference. So um, I'm moving on to um, transfusion reaction reporting. Um, we have a refuse system that we've refined um, over time, but it starts off with um, uh, the form that Slav um, showed you, uh, which we call the M109, that on the back of it, it has um, a transfusion uh, report that um, gets sent with the blood samples to the lab. And uh, it looks like this, and I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see it, and I uh, can't get the pointer going, but. You'll see um, up the top that it gathers some clinical information that helps um, a bit of thinking and helps us also evaluate uh, what might be going on. There's simple things like pul pulse respiratory rate and blood pressure, uh, but it also, um, although it's probably getting a bit late by the time you get up to this paperwork, it reminds people to check the paperwork and see that the correct unit was given. And although it may not help with this person, it might mean the next time around um, when they fill out a form, they remember that they're meant to have done that. And starts to try to put the symptoms and signs into some order, uh, at least to do with um, severity, if not trying to categorise the, the reaction in the middle section. And we also um, have information about the clinical outcome. And we also have supporting information down the bottom that helps um, them determine what sort of blood tests they need. Um, but we do also, as I've mentioned, at the Clinical Skills Lab, r remind them that they actually have to resuscitate the patient. Um, I'll also um, um, say that um, when uh, we first started uh, this, uh, I think uh, transfusion reactions have been investigated for a very long time in the lab where we send samples back, but when we initially reported it, we were thinking of it with a laboratory perspective. Um, was an antibody detected? Um, uh, was there some outcome that the lab was able to show that we now have a positive Coombs test? Um, that sort of aspect. But we're now starting to look at it from the point of view of the clinician. Um, and what do they need to know to allow them 
um, to continue the care of the patient. Is it going to be safe to give some more blood? Uh, was an antibody found? Was it really a transfusion reaction? And what sort of transfusion reaction was it? Was it a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, which means that you may or may not give a pre-med next time? Or was it something more significant that you have to do quite a bit of liaison with the blood bank with? And so we've started um, looking and refining our report to help it help uh, the clinicians understand what happened and also we we'll document the severity of the transfusion reaction and you'll see on this next um, slide which um, unfortunately we give a lot of transfusions to pesto test but um, uh, you can also see that we had a bit of trouble spelling haematology down the bottom uh, but the form um, tells us things about like under general comment, the reaction in this patient is most likely due to an underlying septic condition. So that when you're looking back, you can determine that this wasn't related to the blood transfusion or conversely that it was. And this is hopefully quite useful clinical information. And you can see that the recommendations for future transfusions is a heading or prompt uh, for us to fill in. And we've said in this case that the patient should be closely monitored um, but if reactions continue, that it might, might be worth uh, liaison, liaising with the lab. So um, we also um, outline this procedure in a, an overarching guideline, telling um, clinicians how they might recognise and manage transfusions. And um, as we've mentioned, we also um, roll, have rolled this out at, at clinical skills days. Um, and I have borrowed this from St Vincent's in Melbourne, this colourful chart. Um, a version of this is included in our Austin Hospital um, transfusion reaction guidelines. Uh, but I'm, I'm afraid to say we've got it in our corporate colours of drab green and I, I um, did like the a very colourful St Vincent's version. Um, they've um, developed this tool and they've shared it in the Blood Matters um, group so that people are able to use it. And it helps clinicians try to work out whether this is an allergic reaction, whether this um, could be a febrile non-hemolytic reaction based on the clinical features and helps not only guide the management of the patient but it also helps with um, deciding what investigations have to be done and it also um, helps um, work out what the transfusion reaction is when we're reporting. Um, we also um, generate a risk man report, although um, the ideal in a hospital is that all risk men men or women reports um, happen whenever there's a transfusion reaction. We did find that they weren't always being generated, but that we knew that a transfusion reaction had happened because we did get samples sent to the lab. And so what we've been doing is liaising with the clinical unit so that a risk man is always generated. And we also um, fill in our components so th that there are two records, not only in the laboratory report that you've just seen, which is available in all the pathology results and can be easily accessed at, um, in the future and you don't have to rifle through all the clinical notes to find it, but it, it's also um, in this risk man report. All serious transfusion reactions of ISR 1 and 2 automatically get uh, reported up the line as they probably do in most uh, institutions to the Safety, Quality and Risk Committee and also the Board uh, Safety and Quality Risk Committee. And this is just an example of what the risk man looks like. I know it's very hard for you to read, uh, but I think that um, the, um, what the nurse um, has written and what um, the registrar's written is really quite nice in this case. This is a case of um, a transfusion reaction to intravenous immunoglobulin. And it says, um, the nurse has said that she's, um, that the patient responded to antihistamines, um, that they did have a rash, uh, an itchiness, that they got better. They've um, reported it to the haematology registrar and um, that there were no clinical uh, consequences for the patient. And uh, the summary from the registrar down the very bottom, uh, and even I'm having trouble reading it, is uh, this reaction has been reviewed and a full report has been issued in the pathology information system and it quotes the, the number where it can be found and the date. 
the event is possibly related to intravenous immunoglobulin. There are no long-term consequences. Advice on pre-medication for future IVIG infusions has been included in the report mentioned above. And it may be that some may not be as comprehensive as this, and you could argue about whether this advice is correct and whether perhaps um, a different in intravenous immunoglobulin preparation should be tried. But at least uh, there's documentation, there's thought about it, and there's also um, involvement of the clinical unit. We have the registrar always ring up and talk to the clinical unit. So we've got this continuous feedback about the importance of transfusion reactions and how you, you manage them. And we're also finding that increasingly we're getting more reports and more invo involvement and discussion about them. So um, the final part of the talk is uh, reporting to the highest level of governance. And I think uh, most institutions have this happening in an automatic manner and they probably won't need to think about this anymore for this uh, type of accreditation because they've already got this in place. But um, we have a transfusion committee. Um, our minutes are supplied to the Safety, Quality and Risk Committee. We do perform uh, formal presentations to both that committee and the board, Safety, Quality and Risk. And any uh, ISR 1s and 2s do have root cause analyses performed so that we can look for any system issues. Uh, we report, um, being Victorian uh, based, um, to the STIR reporting system, which ha the majority of um, people who contribute are from Victoria. Uh, for those who are out of um, the state um, and don't contribute to this one particular one, it's a central um, reporting system where uh, serious adverse events are reported. Um, we also <coughs> report near miss events um, as well as wrong blood in tubes. Uh, we also report to the Red Cross um, if there's been a significant adverse event that may have a traceability and recall implications such as a trolley. And we also report um, to the manufacturer if it's a specific manufacturer um, um, product such as an immunoglobulin. And um, I think uh, that the, uh, I've just got some features of the STIR process just for those who are not familiar with it, that there is an initial form. Um, this may go in without blood transfusion committee um, review, uh, but generally by the second layer form we've tried to look at um, the issue at the blood transfusion committee. Um, and uh, as you may know, for those people who, who do um, report to STIR, we already try to classify the transfusion reaction, be it a trolley or incorrect a blood transfusion component at the time of um, the initial uh, submission. Um, and STIR feeds back to us um, by way of a biannual report, uh, which is distributed to the chief executive officers. And um, I'm just going to reiterate some of the things that Slav and I have spoken about. Um, we think that there are a number of things that we do um, well or have got a new approach to with the criteria two. Uh, we believe that we have a process that facilitates the entire history of transfusion. Um, we also have um, a discharge summary that communicates with the local doctor that there may be a transfusion reaction uh, that's delayed possible. Um, they um, can contact us if, if they feel that there is an issue, having known that there has been a transfusion. Uh, we have a system for reporting and review of transfusion reactions, uh, which we think is encouraging uh, the majority of transfusion reactions to be reported. Um, we have a new auditing framework, um, the BAT tool, uh, which we think uh, really takes the responsibility uh, for improvement back to the ward level. And um, we also um, have good rates of documentation in the notes, even though this um, is a challenging area, uh, which I think nobody's got a fantastic um, answer to. Uh, but we do know that um, we've had uh, electronic solutions in other areas of the hospital uh, that you have to be really careful for of if you think that they're going to be your answer to having mandatory things that you can show for accreditation. We found that unless it's a drop-down box, it does not work because the majority of our requests in our lab for mandatory things are a full stop. 
and that uh, I don't think that would go very well for accreditation that you say that um, that um, the indication for transfusion was 99% full stops. Um, uh, but, and so we're still relying on, on clinical notes and I really think that that's always a challenge. Um, we've also found with the BAT tool that sometimes people interpret the questions a little bit differently so you have to be really careful how you word the questions and although they should be black and white sometimes people do evaluate um, things a little bit differently and although um, probably numbers were the issue with our results with the BAT tool um, we, we think that sometimes um, people aren't looking in all the areas of documentation and, and noticing where things are and that if you've got an experienced auditor they often have uh, uh, improved rates of compliance. Uh, it's always a challenge to get continuous improvement and um, we're always encouraging all transfusion reactions to be reported. However, the lab isn't enjoying all the work that they're doing um, um, investigating all of this. Um, and um, we do believe that Blood Matters will be auditing um, transfusion reactions, um, surveying um, hospitals in the near future. And I think Slavin, I'll be happy to take any questions. Questions? Lady in red. Hi. I was just wondering about your blood transfusion form that you have. Is that used in ICU and ED and in theatre as well for prescription and administration? Um, yes, it's used in all. Um, yes, it's, it's used in all clinical and critical care areas. Um, it, however, is not used intraoperatively. It is pre and post from recovery onwards, but not intraoperatively. Hi. Um, we underwent a mock survey beginning of this year and under best possible history we received a recommendation because we didn't have the history of, of any of the products documented outside of our hospital. We had everything that we had administered at Peter Mac but the recommendation said that we didn't get the history of blood products administered when the patient was 10 I years old Carol or something like that. Okay, true. Um, well, we've been um, grappling this too because we similarly got a recommendation and that was kind of why I was saying that it's really not relevant why they're making us do this. It's not going to change our management. Um, it's not going to improve our safety. We actually looked back over five years and we found that um, probably a ratio of one in 30,000 that we found a low incident antigen in someone that we couldn't detect from the um, group and screen and prob uh, probably um, we, we found that that person didn't have a transfusion reaction history. So knowing that history wouldn't have made any difference. So. At the moment we're still debating this, but we had thought that we would write uh, a risk assessment using that data saying that we've looked at this issue and it's not a risk. And we've been told that that will be sufficient as long as you've done a risk assessment and shown that the risk is negligible or very, very low, that you will be able to pass that standard. Now the alternative is that we um, do try to make sure that everybody ticks all those boxes knowing that it's a waste of time and huge amount of resources to make people do something that's really irrelevant just to pass accreditation. But as we get m closer to accreditation, I'm getting more and more nervous and thinking maybe we'll do that. <laughs> it, it wasn't even about the reactions, it was yeah. about the history. Yeah. It, and if the patient didn't have a reaction, that's okay, yeah. but we need to yeah. know all the products. Yeah. And the thing is that those sort of things don't help you and no. we don't have a statewide system. We're going to argue exactly the same exactly. thing. And um, even in other states who have better systems, it's really about collecting data about antibody detection, which is not what that's about. And so I don't think anybody's got that. And the standards are being sometimes evaluated by clinicians who are not in this area, who do not know that that that's not available anywhere. 
Um, but we do know that people have passed and they've in the same situation as us. I know it's my mistake and a note to take back <laughs> to the Commission. Sorry, don't tell the people coming to see us. <laughs> um, um, but with, is there anyone from the offer? Because we know that they've passed and they have an excellent um, response to this. Yeah. The 2012 UK SHOT report says that in order to reduce harm and manage risk that in the UK at least and probably here in Australia with a much smaller population, we should have a laboratory information system that re can record the patient's transfusion history from birth to death. Yeah. And that would help us as transfusion laboratory scientists because there are patients out there who are uh, nightmares, untransfusable and they can rock up on my doorstep any time and Nobody will know how to necessarily all the history. True, but we also have telephones. I'm sorry to be uh, yeah, flippant. But, we, and, you don't, but you don't know who to and, call. And we don't have... Yeah, exactly, but we, they, you might have known... They might be able to find out where they've been before, and we do phone a lot. And also, we can't wait to be like Scandinavia or Holland and all have the one computer system. It's not right. going to happen. And how, how else... If anybody else has got any ideas of how we're going to do this, please let me know. Well, the, the yeah. problem is that the laboratory might be in Whoop Whoop West and yeah. closes at 5 o'clock on a Friday True. night and yeah. it's Saturday, Saturday night yeah. at 7 o'clock and you've got no hope of knowing exactly yeah. where, to, where to phone and then you're wasting precious time to try and find out and True. that's difficult. But statistically we can show that doesn't happen that often. Um, I'm going to have to bring it to a close. Yep. And so maybe the debate can rage on outside. <coughs> I'd like to, uh, before you, I'd like to present both Slav and Carol, just a small token of appreciation from everyone here.